So it's a, it's a pleasure for, for me to be here. Uh, actually, we did nothing. Uh, uh, it's, this work is a collaboration of uh, uh, NVIDIA and EMGS working together to, to assess the potential of, uh, of GPUs for our uh, main application. And, and I'm very pleased the way it has turned out. I'm very grateful uh, and thankful to, to the work that has been done and the resources provided by NVIDIA. So, so the work I'm going to present here is uh, some results have been run on, on multi-core of what we have uh, already in production. So this is Sandy Bridge results. And, uh, and then we'll compare that to some open ACC uh, port made by NVIDIA. And, person of Francois Courteil in, in, in front of me here, and compare these two results. So if the speed up is not there, it's, it's Francois' fault. It's not mine. <laughs> right, so the outline of my talk, I, I think for us it's very important to present you the big picture. It's not only about uh, what's happening inside the GPUs, but it's also about the whole production, because we are running different business units uh, and different users interact with the cluster, and, and for us, the operational part also is very important. And that's, we'll talk about that a bit later. But first, I want to introduce you about EMGS, what we do, what's the technology that we are uh, uh, delivering, and it's, uh, as opposed to the first talk, which was about Seismic, our technology is, a com it is meant to be used in combination with Seismic. So it's not to replace it, not at all. Uh, because e, uh, EM data has much, much more value when it's combined with seismic data. And then I'll present you the main, the main workflow that we are having today. It's a 3D inversion. So how do we, after the data are acquired, acquired how do we interpret that? And, uh, and within this workflow, we have the core, the, the cornerstone, which is uh, the modeling engine. And, and this is where the time goes. And this is what we have uh, targeted as a very obvious candidate for, for GPU uh, uh, port. And uh, so, of course, we have some obvious uh, motivations for doing this. And one of them is, uh, is looking ahead at the next generation of 3D inversion that we are going to deliver uh, next year. So that's the first part of the talk. And then we have some performance analysis uh, results, uh, both run on a, on a synthetic benchmark and then with our own code. And I'll conclude with some remarks and, and some future works uh, possibilities. So EMGS is, uh, is a pioneer in the EM industry. Uh, we are the technology and market leader. Actually, it's only us for the moment, so it's not that difficult to be a leader. But, uh, but we are trying to establish the market. And uh, we see that uh, some, we are very good uh, uh, well, I can show that in the next slide. So we have some, of, so some offices. So the main technology is developed in Trondheim, uh, Norway. But we have also offices in Oslo, Houston, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And we see the activities going also in, increasing in Southeast Asia. So we are opening a, a, an office also in Indiana. About 200, uh, 200 250 employees, uh, counting people uh, offshore. And uh, so it's a spin-off from Statoil, the Norwegian oil company. So yeah, we have some um, deliver, delivered more than 600 surveys right now, um, and we, part, we so we sell our services to to oil companies. So we have had two big contracts with Pemex and Petrobras, and now we see that there is a shift toward uh, South Asia, as I, as I said. So I have for uh, for you a little movie explaining a bit what, what is it that we do and what's the technology behind it. Seismic data is the cornerstone of exploration and is used to map the subsurface layers and structures. Here, two potential hydrocarbon reservoirs have been identified from seismic interpretation. The question now is, do the reservoirs contain water or hydrocarbons? And which one should the oil company drill? To help answer this question and reduce exploration risk, more and more customers are turning to 3D EM data. Controlled source electromagnetics, CSEM, relies on the difference in the electrical resistivity between oil and water-bearing sediments. 
Well log resistivity has been a key hydrocarbon indicator since the 1920s, as sediments saturated by oil and gas display higher resistivity than water-filled sediments. What EMGS has achieved is to apply this principle to the remote indication of hydrocarbons, that is, to measure subsurface resistivity from the seabed. A high power source of EM energy is towed over a grid of receivers, placed one to three kilometers apart, at known locations on the seabed. By measuring the refracted energy from subsurface layers, we are able to identify areas of high electrical resistivity, an indicator of hydrocarbons. From one line of receivers, we can image a vertical section with however limited resolution and depth positioning. In a 3D survey, a grid of active receivers record both inline and azimuth data. This allows us to map resistivity variations in all three dimensions, providing increased coverage and resolution. Integrating seismic and 3D EM provides an improved understanding of the subsurface geology. In this case, the updated geological model has resulted in a new lead, which was not discovered in the first round of seismic interpretation. CSEM results can be calibrated when well log resistivity measurements are available. This, in turn, provides improved confidence in the interpretation. In mature areas, where the reservoir saturation and porosity is known from well logs, the CSEM data can also be used to estimate hydrocarbon distribution and total volumes. EMGS has performed over 500 surveys since 2002 to reduce exploration risk and improve drilling success rates across the world's mature and frontier basins in water depths ranging from about 30 to 3,500 metres for a range of exploration and production companies. All right, so uh, let's go back to the... So that's, that's where the real, <laughs> the real stuff uh, happening is on, in, on, on the vessel. And what, uh, what we do is then get the data uh, on shore and so uh, there are some data cleaning uh, happening and then the interpretation uh, starts and this is what i'm going to to continue with now this 3d inversion workflow so this is sketched here as um sorry i have to do that once more so this is uh Basically, what we do is that we have our, so this, what you see is a slice of the, of the initial model, and the triangles are receivers. And we start with an a priori model, a start model, and this can be constructed based on the knowledge that we have from the area or if we have seismic data. So this is wrong by uh, definition, but uh, we are trying, we, what we will do is to update this model iteratively and stops when, we, when we're happy. So we start with some, um, Oh, sorry, we start with some uh, the data that we have um, acquired. So we know for each receiver we we have some some the phase and the amplitude of the signals that have been measured, and we give that to uh, the modeling engine. And from that, uh, so we give the model the priori model, and this uh, this modeling will spit out the electric and magnetic fields that will be used, uh, regularized and used to compute the misfit with what we have measured. So in black here we had uh, the original data and this is what the modeling is giving us given this model, which is wrong obviously. So we have some misfit, so we are not happy, so we go back. And what you should, uh, what I should emphasize is that this is not only one job for every receiver. So in, if a survey has 200 receivers, we are scheduling 200 jobs more than 200 jobs actually because it's multiplied by the number of frequencies that we are using and the number of fields that we are interested in. So we could have 400 jobs that makes up one iteration, uh, 400 modeling jobs, and when we have to wait for the very last one to finish in order to proceed. So this is something that I've uh, been um, looking at more and more because I was working in that box trying to optimize profile change the code, but at the end of the day, I saw that the scheduling was just killing the performance. It was gone because people were using, waiting in queue on a cluster. So we, we have also to, to keep that in mind. 
So eventually the, the inversion will converge and uh, yeah, everything looks fine and, and we are happy. The true synthetic model was like that and the, the output is like this. So, but this is very, like a lot of model can match the misfit. I mean, can, can, can go away with the misfit, but then you have, you need people behind to understand really what's, uh, if, the, if this makes sense and, uh, or not. Um, yes, so what we are using in our modeling is, uh, is a Yi grid uh, to represent the magnetic and, uh, and the electric fields. We use a Yi grid. It's, it's pretty, uh, it's very, very well known. And we are solving the Maxwell equations with a finite difference uh, scheme. So to update the electric fields, we use uh, magnetic fields and vice versa. Uh, we use a fourth order um, difference in, um, in uh, x and y dimensions because here the, the medium are kind of homogeneous, but in the z direction we have, we have this interface with the seabed, which is quite tricky uh, so that we can't, we can't use fourth order uh, uh, in that direction. So we only use two, and, and this limits a bit of accuracy, but for the moment, it's the best we can do. Um, so the computation, computational resources required to solve one Elon job is based on the size of the initial volume, but also the discretization, how many cells you make your model of, and, uh, and also the time stepping, how many uh, steps do you need to converge, and this is correlated to the nature of the data, how resistive is your data, how fast travels the signal into your, uh, into your model, and the time it takes to, to interact with all the elements in that model. And up till now, we have been, or we, our users, they have, they have seen that the stuff, it goes slow. So if they have two fine grids, uh, the job just is, uh, is taking too long. So they have been auto-censoring themselves to, to, to to not take too, uh, too fine grids or just, and this is a limitation that, that I hope GPUs can help us to, to relax and do more, uh, more, more, more work. So why do we look at accelerators? We have some obvious motivations like reduce turnaround times or increase the throughput of our jobs because today in production we have like 20,000 modeling jobs per hour. So 20,000 uh, is about 90% of our traffic. And uh, of course, if GPUs can make us more efficient, and then, then we are very interested. So that's also decreasing the total cost of ownership. Like if we can do more with less, we're happy. But also, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have this next generation of 3D inversion coming around and are just around the corner. And then, then the scale just, the, computer, the computing demands will just explode like now we have 20,000 jobs for the whole, per hour, for the whole production. But one single next generation inversion will spit, if we go with this modeling engine, will spit like 10,000 jobs for one iteration. And we may have 30 of these going on at the same time. So that if we, if we stay like this for today, like we'll have to buy, I don't know, I don't know how many, uh, how many in Sandy Bridge, uh, it will just, so we really need to, uh, ha to have a look at what's around us and GPUs, we see that we re register that a lot of people are using them and, and it seems like stupid to, to not do it as well. We do have some concerns uh, like the programmability, what, what will happen to, because we have no experience uh, with GPUs, so we heard about OpenACC, sounds great, but can we get away with this? Or, what would be the performance? Uh, what do we what do we gain? What do we lose by not using CUDA directly? This is a known. Also, what will happen to our code base? Do we need to to have two code bases? We don't have time for that, really. So, and then uh, the operability, the operation side of things. What's happening if I have a heterogeneous cluster? Like some some nodes are accelerated with GPUs, some are pure multicore. If one of my, let's say I have 100 jobs being scheduled on a cluster, if one of them, if 99 goes on the GPUs and one goes on a multi-core, then I will wait for this very, very single job to terminate and then the performance is gone. So there are some issues there. 
uh, that we need to sort out. That's why I'm here to just learn about how people are using GPUs, not only uh, inside the GPU, but also uh, at a more operation scale. Uh, let's, look, let's look at some code. Um, so we have, as I said, several levels of parallelisms. We have at the job level, and then within a the job, we have inter independent uh, tasks going on, like we have fields in the X, Y, and Z the dimensions. These can be updated uh, in parallel. And then within each update of these fields, we can update uh, the cells in parallel as well. Um, so since we have so many jobs, it doesn't make sense really for us to, to go MPI, so we just use OpenMP. Um, and then by uh, looking at the GPUs, it's, we, use, uh, we offload the work to the GPU via OpenACC, and, uh, and Francois used the CAPS compiler in, in his work. And then we have this classical performance engineering, uh, engineering approach where we, we do some profiling, we do some changes, and we test that uh, the, the accuracy is still, uh, is, still, is still there, the results are correct. And this is what uh, Francois has been struggling a little bit uh, because of some, of some challenges that are not that obvious. Uh, we'll come back to that later. So these are some first results on, uh, <clears throat> on YeBench, synthetic benchmark, uh, solving uh, Maxwell equations. Um, yeah, so what you can see is uh, the time, stoop, time, time stepping loop. Uh, some data has been uh, being copied. I think you use the PGI for this work. Uh, and, uh, and then we update the, the magnetic fields uh, and update the electric fields, but in there, in our code, we have a lot of stuff going on so that you may have some back and forth with data between the device and the, and the host. And uh, here you have this, this back and forth, but it's only one, one single point at the source of the center, and, uh, and then we exit the loop. So in the kernel, this is very similar to what we do, but it's only second order final difference. Uh, so the amount of, uh, of computation, it's, it's even worse actually in that case, because you do very little data uh, you do very little work with the data that you that you operate on. So here are some results that Francois put together. Um, it's compared to uh, Westmere uh, architecture, and uh, he, when he just dropped his uh, his OpenACC directives, he got a pretty good uh, speed up, uh, and then with uh, some more optimiz optimizations, uh, he managed to to improve the the result even more. Um, then we are going to talk to SolidBridge, and this is just me running uh, the stream benchmark on our platforms, because we know this code is, is memory bound, and I was interested to see how, how much, how many cores do I need to exhaust my bandwidth. So I, I ran uh, the stream benchmark in two, two modes, one with uh, non-temporal stores, so when you store your data, you buy right through. You don't put that in a cache. And this gives the, most, the best performance. But I know that in my case, I can't do that. Because the arrays that we use, uh, we update, the updates uh, are, uh, are made with the arrays that we use to store the result back. So this, this, uh, sorry, this, um, this non-topoal store will not be available for us. So what we should be looking at is this curve for us. We know that with with three cores, basically, on, on a single CPU, we'll exhaust our bandwidth. These are the result of our code. Uh, so here is a VTune profile. Uh, so we are waiting a lot. Um, this, I'm not sure where exactly, but the most, uh, the most uh, the hotspots uh, are this one, when we record the green tensors, and these three curl routines when we update the fields. Uh, five minutes, right. Then I have to speed up a little bit. And um, with the bandwidth, we see that we can sustain like nine gigaflops uh, while our uh, operations can, uh, uh, can go much faster than that. So we are clearly memory bound here. Here are some benchmarks that I did um, uh, with data parallelism or task parallelism. And uh, here on these curves, it's only one job on the on the multicore, while um, uh, packing packing the 
the CPU, I have eight cores, I put eight jobs on them, the runtime goes up, but uh, the throughput uh, is much better, right? So I lose in speed up, but the throughput is there. And since I have so many jobs, it's important for me to have throughput. This is a port done by Francois, so it's, it's looking nice, uh, like just a few directives here and there uh, before the recording of the green tensors. And here we did some, some tuning, some manual tuning, I believe, to find the right uh, numbers here. But it can also look ugly uh, because our code is not, uh, is not nice. It, uh, it's, so there is, open ICC is, is, uh, is fine, but uh, sometimes it's, it can also degenerate a little bit. This is a result for, by, made by Francois. So on, uh, on a K20, he got uh, uh, like three and a half uh, speed up on, uh, when the, for only one job on a, on a, on a, on a GPU, a CPU, but when we go and load, uh, then you can also uh, do something with the other cores on a, on a sandy bridge. So then you get even better speed up. But with the K10, maybe a better choice for us because we can have two of these. Uh, I'll just skip this one. It's inside the main loop. Uh, here we did some experiments just stripping down our code to the main hotspots and develop a mini application that he used to, to uh, to identify the, the hotspots uh, and to tweak and tune and to see what, uh, how this hotspot can, can go. So he used also some profiling tools, NVProf and GProf. So let me conclude uh, fast. So we are very happy with the results so far. Our code is, is running faster on the GPUs. Uh, we know there are some room for improvement because not everything could be uploaded to the GPU. And also we see that CUDA kernels can improve our performance uh, quite, uh, in a quite efficient way. So OpenACC port was not straightforward. There were some bugs here and there that, uh, that kind of made the, the, that makes the results incorrect. But uh, all in all, uh, this CAPS uh, compiler turned out to be uh, very, very handy. So for us, the next step would be to look at what has been done, understand it, and also start to look at what kind of configuration we should go for in terms of CPU and GPUs, but also how do we operate uh, these in, uh, in production. And, uh, and then also do some calculation on the back of the envelope, like costs and uh, performance uh, cost and all this. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll conclude now because I maybe have a little bit of a time and uh, if there are some type of questions, I'll be happy to, to take them. Yeah, we have time for, thanks, Cyril. We have time.